Welcome back to another Jazz Matters podcast. Today we are talking with the great Don Morris, a uh, vibe player. And of course, we have our co host, uh, Vaughn Coulter of uh, Jazz Beats Radio. And what we're going to do uh, is go ahead and dive right into it. Uh, for all those who don't know uh, Don Morris, Don, can you just uh, tell us uh, where you're from and how you got started in this business? That's a, that's a long process. I'll give you the quick synopsis. Yeah, just give me the, the quick one. Okay, the quick part. Born in the Caribbean, moved to Boston at the age of 12. It wasn't my idea, but that's why I ended up. I subsequently went to Berkeley, started uh, a bunch of different bands while I was in Berkeley. Uh, and shortly after I finished at Berkeley, I moved to California, where I ended up in the Bay Area and worked there until I started going on the road with people like Roberta Flack and Marvin Gaye. And everybody kept saying, you gotta move to LA, get the studio, make some real money. So I moved to LA and, and spiraled down the grease slide to financial oblivion until one night I found James Gadsden as a sub on a gig I was doing. Gadsden liked me and next week I was in the studios <laughs> because he was the prime studio drummer at the time. And then I did about a decade, decade and a half in the studios. And when all of that collapsed with technology, I moved back up to the Bay Area and went up and then up into Sacramento and, and had bands up that way. And uh, then when my wife took a position in St. Croix, we moved to the, to the Virgin Islands. And I was there until the, I ended up, when she took a position in Atlanta, I ended up here and here I be. Okay. But it's, been, it's been an interesting, long, up and down career as usual. Cool. All right, let me ask you a question. Um, let me see, how do you see the culture uh, changing <clears throat> over the years, like right now where we are uh, and where, we, where we're going after all of this uh, pandemic and so forth is over. Um, <clears throat> how do you see the culture changing? Well, the pandemic has really, really impacted everybody. I mean, I, I sit here and say, I wonder if we will ever play live music again, you know, with the pandemic banging at us like this. But then, uh, you know, we're, we're doing what we can do, like what we're doing right now in order to sustain it. Uh, I've had several friends who uh, are very established tell me that they think that once this thing breaks, there's going to be such a hunger for live music that we'll probably have a better situation for all of us when that happens. But of course, by the time that happens, some of us may not even be able to do it any longer. You know, there's no telling. I, I saw, I saw a, uh, a picture the other day that my wife showed me that was very funny. It said, the pandemic is over, the kids are back at school in 2045. And then what it had was a whole bunch of middle-aged people sitting at desks, you know, in the fourth grade, right, trying to resume where they were. You know? well, so who knows? With the way they're going about it, that might come to be. But uh, all in all, um, if you uh, can kind of, uh, you know, I always ask this question, you know, who, who, who were your influences uh, in the music? You know, who was it that really directed you into this, this field? That's very interesting. I, I was influenced to get off of drums, which is where I started, and onto mallets amazingly enough by listening to a, an old doo-wop record one night when I was going to sleep in high school. It was um, uh, Crazy For You by The Heartbeats. It starts out with a vibe chord. And I said, ooh, maybe I should play vibes. And then I started listening the, on the same radio stations to Earl Bostick. I don't know if anybody remembers him, but he was a major alto player way back in the day. And and then subsequently, I started getting influenced, of course, by Milt Jackson and, um, and then Cal Jado, because I kind of liked the Latin things, you know, coming out of a Caribbean culture. And um, 
subsequently, I, I hooked up with Cal Jader and he became a, a friend and a teacher. And then what really turned me around was my connection with Randy Weston. Randy and I met in the uh, early 60s and he became my mentor and my musical hero and completely altered the way I play. I, I became much more Afrocentric and much more uh, angular and rhythmic in my playing style. I got away from that smooth kind of thing that the other players were doing on vibes. Mm -hmm. So other than those, those two, Mel Jackson and, and uh, Cal Jader, I was never influenced by vibe players. I was influenced by percussionists, saxophone players, and piano players. Okay. Mostly Randy Weston. Right. Now, do you think um, music uh, today, has it come down to uh, a cultural uh, art form or has it come down to like the bottom line and the bottom line meaning, you know, just money? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. And I think it probably requires more of a response than we have time to do here. Okay, let's um, get the short version. The short version is that I think there's, there's an awful lot of money going in weird directions with, because there's a lot of what's being done today has no legs. As you and, you and everybody else knows, including Vaughn, the, the old standards are with us forever. But uh, nobody's going back out there and playing what some hip hop or, or rap group did six months ago. I mean, it has no longevity. There's, and I, I don't know what to do about that. I think that gradually it's going to change simply because if you look at rap and hip hop, that's really what they did with beat poetry in the 50s. It's, it's a guy standing up there reciting poetry with a music background. It's, it's done differently, of course, because this is a very different musical culture. But it's, it's, still, it's still linear. It's still within the realm of what could be. And as, as these rappers tend to, to get more enamored of jazz musicians, and I see that happening, it could, it could have a very positive effect down the road. Well, you know, uh, I had um, talked to some young musicians uh, that say, well, well, you know, the older musicians, they've had their day and their stuff is done and they don't really care, you know, what they've done. Now that, you know, they're exposed to, you know, the contemporary styles of the day that they do, they don't seem to have a... Uh, 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 that much of an appreciation for uh, straight ahead jazz. And uh, yeah. I often wondered if that was simply because, you know, jazz as a whole, the, 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 the standards that you were talking about. See, the reason why they exist, and we both know the reason why the standards are such a standard is because every musician that played, played the other musicians' tunes. And that kept keeps it going all the time. Like, think about how many times you ever heard Embraceable You. You know what I'm saying? And that uh, was a song that was written, but that, well, look how many times it has been recorded, re-recorded. Now, when you take a lot of the young jazz people of today, when they come out with a great record uh, for, the, for what the radio stations want right now, uh, it's not going to be necessarily played uh, decades down the road. No, no you see, and, and that's why I was asking the question, you know, piggybacking on the same question about has it um, come down to culture or has it come down to the bottom line, which is dollar? And we both just, I think, agreed on it. It's come down to dollar. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. Because Vaughn, when, Vaughn when I need you to weigh in on this. Say to me, people say to me, "Do well, you have any material?" And it's always. Uh, but it's got to be something smooth jazz because that's the only thing I can sell. Right. right. I mean, so it's, that's, it's that's, where, that. that's where the that's, art form is going. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, I think that gets close to home because uh, being in a, uh, on internet radio and, and, and having to make adjustments with the standards to um, open up the door for smooth jazz. It's, it's, it's kind of like a, it's, it's a, 
it's an interesting situation you have to put yourself in, um, or you're put in regardless whether or not um, you're, um, it, it's not an, it's not an option. Um, of course, you know, uh, broadcasting a commercial radio is it's, it's built on numbers. It's it's built on ratings and uh, how many listeners you have and. Uh, the success of, of what it is uh, airplay-wise when your music is in rotation a lot. And um, uh, ratings, people like BDS and, and airplay and all of these other rating systems, that's how um, musicians have their success through the airplay and the rotation of how often that music, their song is played. And so, you know, it, you, you have to, you know, it, it, it's difficult because most radio stations don't want to go into whole standards and, and classic or, you know, um, um, tunes that, that have generational legs, I call it, or timeless sounds uh, uh, implemented. But, you know, it, I think that a lot of times, you, at least from, um, you would hope that, you know, your program directors that are doing this music allow the flexibility to be able to stick in, you know, a standard like uh, Sunflower by Stan, by uh, Sunflower by Freddie Hubbard, or, um, you know, uh, Sidewinder by Lee Morgan. Um, I think it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's really a, a method of operation you have to have to be able to blend in music of the now with the past, because how do you know where you're going if you don't know where you've been? That's how I feel about um, where where the music needs to go to. You know, um, I often said, you know, I go by the book where, you know, just hearing other uh, air personalities make the statement. I remember one that was just phenomenal, but he said, there would be no Freddie Hubbard, there would be no, no, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, from the player like um, um, Joshua Redman or uh, uh, another trumpet player by the name of, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, his name escapes me at this moment, um, Art Farmer. Um, if there was no um, Clifford Brown, you know, without Clifford Brown, these, these trumpet players would not be around. There would be no Winston Marcellus if there was no Clifford Brown. So this is where this, this is where the process has to continue. These musicians of the past must be played. Um, standards must be played. But you know, you get into commercial radio nowadays, and I can tell you, I can count the number of commercial radio stations that do jazz on one hand. And uh, you know, if if you're not dedicated to the sound, you're going to to uh, uh, decimate. Um, the, the the music of, of the now. I mean, you you gotta have those those musicians' music still being played. You got to have it. And uh, you know, like you said, the hip hoppers are finding out samples from these musicians, and it, it's becoming you know uh, commonplace for them to um, implement their music within what they're doing with the rap and the hip hop, and and that culture is building. But it's our responsibility as uh, as air personalities and, and, and people involved in the radio and playing this music, to be able to still be dedicated to the art form. And uh, it's a tragedy that it's not like that right now. It, it is truly a tragedy. So I'm fortunate to be in a situation where the radio station where I'm at is still dedicated to the uh, preservation of jazz. And so that's where I'm happy. And from what I'm feeling in my heart and soul, it's where I'm going to be at. Because I don't like to struggle with with uh, with uh, uh, bean counters and accountants and and people that are bent on numbers and and you know although I know that's still part of the process, but the music still has to speak for itself. Now, Don, uh, do you um, are you going off into any of the newer contemporary stuff uh, that that's out there now? Because I know that I end up uh, doing a lot of of it anyway and it's almost like it's a must 
you know, if you want to mm-hmm. survive, you know what I'm saying? And it's always, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not mad at it because basically it's, it's easier for me to do that than to do stay ahead <laughs> simply because, you know, the newer contemporary stuff is, is no more than a groove or a vamp. So, and, and it seems to have a really uh, attractive audience, you know, for it. So are you doing, are you moving into that direction also? Or do you, have you done any stuff in there since? Well, yes and no. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place. To, to jump back to what Vaughn was saying about, you know, foundations, I, I believe you have to know what came before to know. You have to know where you've been to know where you're going, as he said. But, it, you know, to, to get to what you're saying about uh, contemporary music, of course it's easier. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no way in hell that you're going to take a, you go to my head, just as an example, and soloing on that, and then compare that to say wine lights, even even to go to Grover Washington, you know, right. wine lights is essentially a blues with a bridge. It's a big deal, right? right? But you know, those old tunes were harmonically thick, and you had to really pay attention. I mean, half the stuff that's out there now, and I'm not denigrating it. I mean, the, you know, the groove is the key to it all. Because if, if you go back to, you know, Africa and Baku and the wing of the Kwanzaa, which means Africa is where everybody came from first, and Africa is the drum. So you, it's all going to be rooted in rhythm anyway. Right. And I, I've been telling people for my entire career, which has gone on for way over a half a century at this point, that if you've got a band, once you lock the rhythm section down, the rest of it's easy. You know, you get you get the bass player, the piano player, and the drummer all in the pocket. Everything else can ride on that with no problem at all. And yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yes, of course it's easier, but you know, harmonically it's easier but it makes you really pay attention because otherwise you can get pretty damn boring playing the same thing over and over again. So you've got to get more creative to play on those kind of limited harmonic patterns. Yes. Now, uh, do you um, see the technology uh, basically uh, any transforming jazz or is it just transforming uh, an audio you know, sound, you know, for the most part, because there are jazz players that use the technology very well. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and the thing, and the thing is, they can still do the standards using that technology. Uh, a lot of people will confuse it with the current situation, but it's really the old stuff in the current time, you know, so yeah. it's nothing new for the older musician. It's all new for the younger musician. Mm-hmm. Well, I've, I've watched the transition happen. I mean, as a vibraphone player, I was playing all acoustic music. And when we hit the, say, the early 70s, where everything became electric and loud, I found myself one time playing at the, uh, the Fillmore in San Francisco. And they had about 12 microphones on the vibes. And I just up there flailing my arms around, couldn't anybody hear a damn thing because of this loud guitar players and what have you. So I, I called Claire Musser, I, I, who invented the, the instrument I was playing. And I said, what can we do about this? And after about a year's back and forth, we decided that if I put some um, magnetic bar pickups on, on the instrument, on one, both sides of the vibes, and then running into an amplifier, I was able to amplify acoustic vibes, which was opened up a whole other world for me. And then of course, because of that, I went berserk. And I was, I was attaching things like wah-wah pedals, mutrons, octave dividers. So nobody had any idea what I was playing because it would make all sorts of unvibraphone sounds. Right. And I had to learn to play the devices at that point rather than play the instrument because if I played a normal technique it was mush. Of course that eventually blew over. The thing with that kind of technology is some people would use it really effectively 
and other people would just use the technology because it was there. Right. I remember a pianist I worked with for a number of years who had uh, what was it, Echoplex. So it was, you know, and yeah. a lot of people, the Echoplex would just get in the way of whatever they were doing. He used it perfectly. He knew when to turn it on, when to turn it off. Right. You know, so some people are going to use technology effectively. Other people are going to rely on it and it's going to diminish what they're doing musically. Well, you know, that's, that's kind of what I, I'm missing in the, uh, with the younger players today. They can use the technology very, very well, but they don't seem to be using, uh, now, not all of them. Now, there are some that, that do use music very well along with the technology. But then for the most part, I hear a lot more that use the technology better than they're actually dealing with the music. Oh, yes. You know? yeah, I, I really do that all the time. I had, had a gig at the airport for three years now. And I'd have young people come through all the time and say, oh, I'm in the music business. I say, really, what do you do? I'm a producer. I say, yes, of course you are. <laughs> because what they mean when they say that is, <laughs> I don't really know diddly squat about music, but I can operate a drum machine real you well, go. you know? And, I mean, they, they did need to get some foundational information. They wouldn't know an F7 chord bit the money behind, but they're producers. And it's, it's a, very, a very strange pocket we're in right now. Yeah. There, are, there are people coming out of it who are going back and learning something about the music that they're, they're trying to create and where it came from. And there are others who are just going to fall by the wayside because they're one hit wonders and They'll, they'll make a living in the casinos 30 years down the road with their one hit. Mm -hmm. But right. Well, that that's goes back to, the, to do with music. Right. That goes back to the point when I asked the question earlier about has it what it has come down to the culture or the bottom line. So it's it's uh, it's one of those situations to where I'm pretty sure we're gonna have to deal with this a long time. You know. True, but you've got to have both. You've got to have culture and the bottom line. I mean. You know, the starving artist thing doesn't work for me either. I've got bills to pay. Right. But by the same token, you know, it's not entirely just the money. There's right. got to be some musical integrity involved in it as well. Yeah, at, at least it should be, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, and I'm, uh, and by, you know, Jazz Matters is always given a, a platform to musicians here, uh, all of the resident talent that we can muster up around Atlanta and uh, a lot of uh, and I appreciate the hell out of you for that by the way you well, been thank very, you. Very we appreciate you you've been very influential in keeping this music alive in Atlanta and I appreciate it well the, well the thing is uh, by giving that platform I'm kind of learning believe it or not I'm learning more about that culture versus bottom line thing with a lot of the musicians and stuff that we deal with and and uh, it's almost like uh, okay, I can I can understand it a lot better. I I see uh, exactly where everything is going. That's why I said we're gonna have to is we're gonna deal with it for quite a while. But like, as you said, you know we got we still have to have both because at some point in time, I noticed that there have been a couple of musicians that had followed that were younger, and they are. Uh, are musicians now that uh, seem to be pulling more away from the uh, sequenced electronic stuff and using more musical stuff, listening to more mm -hmm. artists that actually play music uh, acoustically. And yeah. they realize that now that it, it broadens them, it expands their uh, musical horizon, you see. So, and in other words, in my, I'm looking at them mature. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah, as a well, you know, Vaughn was talking a lot about trumpet players, and which leads me to John Burke Gillespie, who mm -hmm. not only one of the greatest trumpet players who ever lived, Dizzy Gillespie, but also one of the, the most wonderfully open and gifted music teachers that ever existed. Dizzy Gillespie would sit you down, and he'd play the piano, and he'd say, look, this is how it all connects. He said, virtually every other instrument is horizontal lines. 
with the piano, you're seeing the vertical relationship of the notes. You understand how harmony works. So that's why, of course, they insisted everybody who, who takes a music degree has to learn to play piano to some level because you've got to understand how the, how the harmonies interconnect, how all of that works, because there's three elements to music. You have rhythm, harmony, and melody. The moment one of those is missing, you have random noise. That's all. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have those three in there to, to some degree or another, mm -hmm. even in hip hop to have that happening. Right. You know, now, it's got to be there. Now, Don, uh, do you have any, um, any material that people can go to online or any sites or anything? I do. It, you can go to my website, which is donmores.com. That's D-O-N-M-O-O-R-S dot com. And uh, there's a number of CDs up there. I'm working on one now, Celebration of St. Croix, because that's home for me. It's called uh, On Our Leeward Isle. It's been somewhat delayed because of the pandemic, but hopefully it'll be in the streets before Christmas time. That's the plan, at least. And mm -hmm. there, there are two or three others, plus there's a couple of, of videos for the... Uh, for those visual learners, there's a couple of DVDs available on my website as well. Okay. Sure. And uh, uh, Vaughn, um, we're getting ready to wrap this up. So uh, let people know where they can uh, find you and listen to your program. Uh, you can find me at Jazz Beach Radio online, at the Jazz Beach Radio uh, webpage. Um, of course, uh, you can find me also on jazzbeachradio.com, uh, streaming live 24-7, 365. I have a show on there that takes place uh, weekdays and on the weekends called Soulscapes. And, uh, you know, Soulscapes is based on um, the uh, lyric or the title of uh, one of Betty Carter's hits called Jazz Ain't Nothing But Soul. And uh, so, you know, that's what I adopted. And... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the genre that still retains soul. And soul is the basis of all that's good in music. Without it, there is no connection with the human condition. Right. And uh, so that is uh, a primary uh, focus of mine when I'm, you know, doing my show. Mm -hmm. And also you can find me on Twitter at Von Coulter one um, My Instagram page is Von Coulter. And so, I, and I recently started another Twitter site, a uh, Twitter page called Ain't Nothing But Soul, and that's dedicated to uh, just, just the soul of a people and all that it has accomplished and its, its, its in, impact on American society. So, um, yeah, I, I, I like the things that I'm doing in, in terms of being able to uh, promote the culture, uh, promote the music and the talent that uh, exists in, in, in Black America. So uh, that's where you can find me. And uh, of course now on Jazz Matters as well. And uh, being able to sit here and, and talk about jazz with you, okay. Edwin Williams. <laughs> All right. And yes, you can uh, find us, of course, at yesjazzmatters.org. That's the website. Uh, we do uh, each uh, Monday at 7.30 we uh, promote uh, and, and put uh, our musicians back on the platform that we're trying to create. And in this, this era, we're doing it with podcasts. So each Monday at 7.30, you can go to Facebook uh, slash Jazz Matters Atlanta. And you can uh, also go to YouTube with it, uh, Jazz Matters Atlanta. So... We're going to wrap it up, Don and, and Vaughn. We'll, uh, we'll wait until we can see a, a little bit more light at the end of the tunnel on this whole issue of being quarantined and everything. I'm not mad at it. Believe me, it gives me a lot of time to get my chops together. So when I do go back out there, I'm not looking behind me. You know, I'm looking in front of me. So mm -hmm. the thing is... Um, we will um, see everybody again. Uh, like I said, uh, every Monday uh, we will have an uh, episode and uh, we'll be glad to get your comments. Uh, just go to Jazz Matters 
dot uh, org and, and check out the website. Thank you. Vedwin Williams. <laughs>